Welcome to the Delicious Alignment Body Love and Food Freedom Podcast, where we talk about all things law of attraction, replacing your love-hate relationship with food with a love-love relationship, how to finally love and appreciate your body, and yes, even release pounds if that's something you desire. I'm your host, Rhonda Ryder, love your body coach and author of Delicious Alignment, how 25 women learn to love and transform their bodies using Abraham Hicks and the law of attraction. Today, I'm excited to share my interview with author, coach, and actress, Karen Laurie. In this episode, we talk about Karen's book, Chronic Pleasure, use the law of attraction to transform fatigue and pain into vibrant energy. Karen shares her challenges with chronic pain, chronic fatigue, and narcolepsy. The narcolepsy was so bad she fell asleep during an audition and in the middle of a dinner with friends. The best part of this interview is when Karen shares how she used the law of attraction and her understanding of the mind-body connection to transform her pain into pleasure in all areas of her life. She now lives a pain-free, vibrant life and shows her clients how to do the same. Let's dive in. Hi, Karen. Hi, how are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for being on my show. I'm so excited to interview you. Thank you, Rhonda. I'm excited to talk to you as well, and we'll have fun. Yes, I have been reading your book, and I really love it. I feel like it was a uh, vibrational, like lifting experience, of course, very, I mean, the energy, it's just, it's like this one big, beautiful rampage, really loved Mm. it. Thank you. And of course, the book I'm talking about today, we're talking about is uh, chronic pleasure. Use the law of attraction to transform fatigue and pain into vibrant energy. Look and that. <laughs> yeah, there it is. There it is. Yeah, the chronic pleasure. Yeah, yes. my first book. Thank you. I really appreciate what you said about it. That's really sweet of you. Yes. Yeah. And so I did learn some more things about you. I, I have seen a couple of your videos. I saw your recent video with. Uh, where you interviewed Bruce Lipton and then I actually uh, maybe it was a couple of years ago I don't know you were on um, Abraham Fun Karen Money Williams is uh, show she has a Facebook group Abraham Fun and I remember listening to your interview there where or you're, you were speaking about all these amazing things a lot of probably what we're going to talk about today and So I would love to hear more about, like, can you tell the listeners about what your journey was like before, before finding the law of attraction and all this stuff that helped you, uh, you know, get better? I know you, you were falling asleep. Well, that's what struck me the most is you were, you know, you had so much fatigue that you were falling asleep a lot and and missing appointments and and just like like because I find that really interesting because I can't even fall asleep on an airplane or anything it's just like (laughs) and you're just like having this experience where you you had a lot of fatigue you had a lot of different things so so please uh would love to just let let you go and just like tell us what your kind of before story is what happened and and what life is like now and I might interrupt you and ask questions but go for it (laughs) Thank you, Rhonda. You're so sweet. And I love that you can't fall asleep unless you, well, I hope you can when you want to. Um, (laughs) Kind of good. Um, Yeah, I had undiagnosed narcolepsy. I had a lot of trauma growing up, um, sexual trauma when I was uh, young and some just emotional trauma and then just the trauma of going to school and having to wear shoes. Um, (laughs) That was kind of traumatic on its own. Anyway, um, and then uh, I grew up, I studied mind body science in college, which I loved. I was fascinated with how the mind affects the body, mostly because anytime I was sick, my mom would say, oh, did something happen at school? Did someone hurt your feelings? Do you have a test you'd want to take? And then I'd think about it and I'd say, yeah, such and such hurt my feelings. And then I would feel better. And then she'd make me go to school. I didn't like it at the time, but it was helpful actually, because she helped me see the link Mm -hmm. between Mm -hmm. what I feel and, and what I want to do. And so that's why I studied mind-body science. And then I became an actor, which turned out to be the perfect Petri dish for mind-body science because with every single role I played, I had a different physiology. Mm 
Mm. And that was so surprising to me when I looked back on it. I didn't see it while I was acting, but when I was in this place of the deepest despair, I saw this pattern of every single character I played, there was a different life experience and a different physiology that accompanied it to one point where I was literally playing a pregnant person and my breasts grew from my normal size C to size D because my body thought I was going to be having a baby. And when the body realized that it was somebody else's baby and I wasn't going to be breastfeeding it, <laughs> um, you know, when I had the baby on the show, the um, my breast went back to size C. Okay, and so wait a minute. So I, I, <laughs> that's just really fascinating. So I did read that story last night, actually. So you're saying that, so you were pregnant in the show and it, what was it the soap opera that you were on? Just curious. Yeah, it, yeah. I was on Life to Live and uh -huh. I played uh, the character Tina and Tina got pregnant with Cord and um, and I was carrying this baby, you know, it was like a leotard with a pillow underneath, you know. So I'm holding, I'm doing this and then I lived in New York and it's really hard to take off all your clothes, take off the leotard, take out the pillow, put all your clothes back on before you've got lunch when you've only got like an hour for lunch and you have to brush your teeth before you go on. And, you know, so I didn't take anything off. It was too much. So I, um, you know, I didn't take my clothes off and the pillow off. So people thought I was pregnant. They would say, oh my God, you're pregnant. And I'd say, no, I'm just an actor. And then they would be like upset. And I was like, okay, I'm not going to say that anymore at the moment. <laughs> that was when I cared what people think. Now I don't. But at the time I was like, oh, <laughs> this is weird. And so I would just go out and I would, you know, rub my belly and people would say, oh, you're pregnant. And they'd say, is a boy or a girl? And I'd say, I don't know yet. Cause the writers hadn't told me. And, um, <laughs> and then I'm playing pregnant on the show and I'm touching my belly and the whole thing. And after um, three or four months, the wardrobe girl came in with my normal bra and a dress that I was gonna wear, like a, a gown kind of thing. And she brought this bra, it was a bra I wore lots um, of times. And we went to put it on and it fit under my breasts, but the breasts flowed over. And um, she so said, oh, fascinating. Oh. it's just, again, the mind, body and how, like what we're telling ourselves, like your, your body, actually, um, your mind and your, your boobs expanded, uh, you know, to the story, to, to the story that you were pretending to be in. So just goes to show a lot of things there. Yeah. Visualization works and what we <laughs> say to ourselves works. So what, what are we saying to our body? Great. So yeah. that's Oh, that's, yeah, that's such a great tie-in because it's true. And when the wardrobe lady went to go get the, a, a bigger bra, she goes, you've grown from a C to a D. And so she went to get a better bra that would fit me. I sat in my room and I thought, oh my God, my mind mm. is having power over my body and mm. my, and it's ready to feed the baby. And then, <laughs> and then, you know, I had the baby and I didn't feed the baby and my breasts went back to normal. But um, it was really interesting. So at a certain point, I had gotten divorced from a man I loved so much, like it had been like a miraculous, incredible spiritual experience when we first met. And then we were getting divorced because this undiagnosed narcolepsy was happening. I also had chronic pain in my body from the sexual abuse. I didn't know it, but apparently when you have sexual abuse, your body hurts later um, as you grow up. And that's what the lawyer told me when, um, I was asked to be part of a case. I ended up getting out of the case because it was so depressing to try to prove how you were so damaged from it, which mm -hmm, was, mm -hmm. was too hard. I thought I was going to kill myself if I kept with the case. So I didn't. Um, but, but I learned that a lot of physical and emotional trauma caused physical and emotional pain in my body. So I had chronic pain. I was falling asleep all the time, but I didn't know it was narcolepsy. That didn't get diagnosed until after I was divorced. But I was literally sometimes would fall asleep while I was driving, mm. you know, just to the grocery store. I'd have to pull over three, four, five, six, seven, eight times, mm. take a short nap and then get to the grocery store or I'd go shop for the groceries and then I'd sit in the car and fall asleep and then drive, drive home, have to stop a couple of times. It was only like four miles away, wow. but it was, it was uh, taxing. And the reason, um, you know, I don't have the narcolepsy anymore. And the doctor said it was incurable. And I'll go into more of that. But so I had the chronic pain. I was diagnosed with um, anxiety, manic depression, suicidal ideation. The doctor said that I would kill myself in the next eight years. And that was 16 years ago. She was wrong. Thank wow. you. 
Um, <laughs> but, you know, so I had all these other emotional issues and I couldn't function. I was burning the meals. I fell asleep on camera at an audition. I fell asleep actually in a movie uh, mm. while they were filming me. Um, you know, and I'd fall asleep at parties. I'd go to these fancy parties. My husband is, was a TV producer and, you know, there'd be these incredible parties and I'd literally go into the room where everybody put their coats on the bed and crawl into the coats and just fall asleep um, because I didn't know how to function. And I was self-conscious. I was ashamed. I was embarrassed. And um, that just exasperated the, the fatigue. So then when we got divorced, I, I met Bruce Lipton kind of before I was divorced um, on the, we were, I had separated from my husband and that's when, or I was just about to separate with, from him. He was just, he was separating me. I, I would have stayed, but, uh, but uh, my, so I met Bruce Lipton and I learned about epigenetics. And when I learned about it, it made total sense. It fit in, it dovetailed exactly with what I learned about my body science. And then I'd been, I, I studied with him more. I, I've been studying with Deepak Chopra since um, the 90s. Mm -hmm. And so I'd been meditating a lot and gone to most of his events and, you know, and we had a friendship. And then um, one day when I was really sick, I, mean, I was literally falling asleep at lunch with girlfriends. You know, I remember it was my mutual friend and I, we had the same birthday and we're both sitting at lunch and we're talking. And then I just literally fall almost face first into my plate. Yeah, wow. don't do these things. I'm, I'm telling you, it's not, it's not cute. But, um, but uh, so a lot of my friends had left me, you know, because I couldn't stay awake. I'm just like falling asleep at their house, falling asleep at their dinner party, falling asleep in their, um, you know, in their bed, you know, just like mm -hmm. laying down somewhere, falling asleep on a couch at a party, you know, it was, it was treacherous. And, um, and then I had this awakening where one day I realized the mind body science that I'd studied, I saw the pattern from acting, how much I had influenced my own physiology through acting and the Petri dish that acting was. I saw how my study and my obsession with mind body science was a true obsession and it was a valid obsession. And it was something that once I started to implement it would make sense. I saw how I'd been focusing on the lack of, of energy, the lack of my husband, the lack of friends, the lack of money, all that stuff. And I immediately that day, things started to shift. I, I got obsessed with alignment and, um, and I just started to understand it better and better and better. Um, I, I started to feel, I'd always been pretty intuitive, but I started to get intuitive with my spirit. I didn't know that I had a spirit before. <laughs> I mean, I knew there was something, but I didn't know what it was. And once I started to get in touch with my spirit and I'd been meditating at the time for 30 years, but I hadn't, I'd been meditating, but I hadn't cleared away the subconscious blocks. And somehow all my, my training from, from acting, mind, body science, also being an acrobat and a, a trapeze artist and a gymnast, um, and then Deepak meditation, yoga, Bruce Lipton, all this stuff sort of, it coalesced in me. And all of a sudden I knew the path on how to heal things. I started to heal things like the, the molestation I had, the sexual molestation when I was a kid. Started to heal that. I started to heal um, all the shame I had. I started to heal all these things. And it was happening effortlessly. It was happening almost on a daily basis. And things were shifting so much. And the pain started to ebb away from my body. I didn't have the pain anymore after maybe mm, nine months or something of doing this, the pain was gone. My energy was shooting up. Like I was getting so much, not shooting up, like shooting up in terms of growing. Vibrancy, yeah. <laughs> I never set up anything. But the energy was getting so much more incredible. I stopped drinking any caffeine. Um, I stopped, um, I, I intuitively let go of sugar. I intuitively let go of grains. I intuitively let go of dairy. Um, and I just stopped eating anything processed. And everything's it was easy to though. It wasn't like um because I read in the book. So it so you're saying and those things fell away. It wasn't like you, I'm going to stop eating this. And you know, it was just like right. No, it was because I had gotten in so much happiness and so much love and so much alignment, and because I was clearing away the subconscious programming that made me want to eat a, a, a whole pan of brownies or made me want to have um Hagen Doss every single night. 
and and morning um <laughs> those, <laughs> like it just ended it just mm -hmm. it just like one day it, actually the way it actually happened with the sugar anyway was i i just kept seeing how sweet people were you know i meet somebody at the grocery store and i'd be like god you're so sweet you know you reached that high thing for me thank you so much that's so sweet of you and then i'd talk to somebody and they'd say something nice and i'd be like oh it feels so sweet and i just kept feeling like everything was sweet mm -hmm. and then i was drinking water and it tasted sweeter and then i ate something like a tomato and i was having like a gustatory orgasm with how sweet it was and then i tried to eat what i normally ate in terms of sugar and i couldn't do it 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 was not, no it was too it was too sweet it was, mm -hmm. it was fake it was fake compared to the sweetness of life and so that's part of what shifted me in terms of the food um but everything you know i had all these food allergies i was told where i couldn't eat food i the certain food and i just started to love ev everything <laughs> and something that used to send me to the hospital for um, so, you know, throwing up because I couldn't. Every time I accidentally ate it, I practiced just loving that that food, and I practiced it and practiced it and practiced it. And then it got to the point where I was at a restaurant. It was in a food that I didn't know it was in. I ate it, and I realized it, and nothing happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I didn't have any of that allergic reaction. I don't have that allergic reaction with anything. Not with any food. Not with any other substance. Yeah. So, so I'd love to go back to where you were talking about where you sort of, you had this awakening of, about the law of attraction. You were, you realized that you were focusing on, on things that you didn't want. Right. And so then you realized, so how did that happen? I think I read that like the, what there was an Abraham Hicks book in the bookshelf or something that you yeah 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 good memory you, know, you had and and you started reading about the law of attraction and you're like oh my gosh yeah I um I was supposed to have a date with my at that point um almost ex husband we we've been separated we we're in the process of getting divorced we we're supposed to have a date he forgot or so he said and um and I was devastated you know I just lay on my couch and I was so depressed and I'd been all you know dressed up and all ready and cute and everything and and I just couldn't do it and I felt this pull from my heart it was like literally like I really felt like there was like a line from my heart and it went to my bookshelf and um and I put my hand out and I touched a book and I pulled it out and I had never seen this book before and I didn't remember until maybe three two or three years later I had gone, when, when my husband and I were separating, I'd gone to Australia and um, I went to go be with um, Bruce Lipton, also with Deepak Chopra and with um, my, one of my best friends, Julie. And when I went to Deepak's, um, Deepak invited me to one of his events. We went to dinner the day before and then he invited me to one of his events. And when I was there um, at the lunch, after, you know, in between, Deepak was there with this guy I had met when I'd gone to his Deepak's daughter's wedding in India. I'd gotten off the airplane in the middle of the night and I'm in this by myself in India and it's, you know, it's wild. It's wild at this airport, mm -hmm. airport um, in Delhi. And um, this man comes up to me and he goes, hey there, you friend of Deepak's? And I was like, I am. Uh, how did you know? And he goes, you just look like you would be. And I said, okay. And he hands, sticks out his hand. He goes, my name's Leon. And he's, I'm a friend of Deepak's too. Let me take you to your hotel. And I was like, oh, thank you. So Leon, I'd met him there and I saw him the whole, it was like an eight day wedding. Mm -hmm. So I knew him from that experience. And he was at that event with Deepak. Leon worked with the Hay House. And so he said, hey, when you come back, uh, hey, when you when you when you're going to go take the airplane to New Zealand, stop by the hey, stop by my work. I'll give you some books. So what he had done was he had just I'd said, I don't know what I want to read, Deep, uh, Leon. I don't know. You just anything that you want. And I said, and I can't carry my, you know, it's too heavy books. Could you just ship them, ship them to my to my house? And he says, oh, sure. So he must have put in the Law of Attraction book by Esther and Abraham. And, um, Jerry, yeah. Western Jerry, gosh, I was based on his name. I, <laughs> we're both trapeze artists, I told him, and he was like, oh, we're both the trapeze, but um, and acrobatics. But um, yeah, Esther and Jerry's book. And so that night I read it, and I didn't know how I had it. It was so weird. Mm -hmm. But I read it, and it it correlated with everything I had studied with, yes. with yes. mind-body science, everything. It made so much sense. It was like an immediate 
awakening. That's what, what happened. Yeah. So that's just so fascinating because my kind of spiritual experience or whatever, or understanding of the law of attraction, you know, has been like, I would say gradual over time and just evolving and evolving is it, it, it always will. And it always, you know, just keeps unfolding. And it seems like you just had this like, bam, like all that, like everything coalesced at once, like you said, and your understanding and yeah, although there is still practice and there's still the yeah. process of removing the subconscious blocks yeah. that I removed. So there was still things and I'm still evolving. I'm still growing. I right, mean, of, I'm course, still of course. Of yeah. Course. Is, I mean, you're not, you're not, you, you got there? You've arrived, Karen? <laughs> I'll tell you what, this is how it feels like. It feels like I've totally arrived and there's new places to go. Yes. Yeah. You know, I feel like I've, I'm there. Like I don't get dips anymore. You know, I'm just like happy. I don't, my subconscious, I've trained it so it's aligned with my conscious mind now. Mm -hmm. So so I don't have to try to be in alignment. I'm just aligned. I just wake up, I wake up happy. It doesn't matter what time or after how many hours of sleep or not or whatever. I'm just happy. It doesn't matter whether I'm with somebody or not with somebody. I don't, it doesn't matter what they're doing or talking about or saying or nothing, nothing, nothing bothers me anymore. Mm. And, um, and so in that sense, I've arrived, you know, like I got it, it makes sense. And then I just keep growing. I like to learn. I like to experience things, you know, so I just keep growing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I, I remember like listening to your interview, like I said, on Abraham fun and just going, just like talking about like, you don't, like, I don't have those dips as much anymore, but I certainly still have some dips. <laughs> And just like to see, you know, for you to model to us that that is like possible. That is so beautiful. Well, you know, actually, it's interesting because like, let's say something happens that I don't want. I have so much faith and I know the path that I don't feel bad about it. Even if it's something terrible, I just read today that there are in rainfall, there's forever chemicals in the in all rainfall that they've discovered. I don't know if this is true, but that means that it doesn't matter where the rain falls, there's uh, forever chemicals, PFAS going into our land, right? So I don't want that. But I just I just have this my subconscious, it's the subconscious that it's so full of faith and love that I don't I can see it. I can see what I don't want, but it doesn't bother me mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know so i can go oh yeah i don't want that but let me let me i know now what to do yeah and I, actually, I actually have a girl i'm going to interview on my show and she has been looking at the gills of manta rays and apparently manta rays and shark whales and some other kind of creature blue whales i think they have a certain kind of filtering system that only allows like a micron of of stuff to get through it and so they're modeling they're bio bio mimicking these filter systems filtration systems so that it could be for example um in your washer so that if there are further chemicals there's a way to, for you to dispose of it before it goes into the into the ocean mm -hmm. uh, or that you know that there's some other way so there's ways they're that, filtering yeah. these uh, these animals the, yeah and she can filter it at such a small yeah, it's such a small level that um, it's in the process of, you know, really being able to remove it. They'd have to find a way to once they've removed it so it doesn't go into the, let's say, the, the, the water system of a farm. Once they've got it, they'll have to, I don't know what the next step is, what you do with those forever chemicals. So that's something I'm going to ask her about when we get on the thing, mm -hmm. if she has an idea or not. But, um, well, how do you feel that, I mean, um, like... I don't really watch the news anymore. Once in a while, I'm looking at the headlines. So just you, like you're saying that you might look at something like this, the chemicals in the rain, and, and but it doesn't bother you. Or how, how, what would you suggest to someone? How does someone get to that place where, you know, I, I mean, I know for me, you know, I've gotten there through um, just the, the practice of alignment, alignment, and I don't know, that steadiness that you get with this practice. It's like you said, like things don't trigger you like they used to. 
Um, and it's really, it's, it's just a wonderful thing. However, I do not like to give my attention to like, like you're talking to me about this, that would be something that I would probably bury my head in the sand about for me personally, because I could, that could, ugh, you know, I don't even want to give my attention to that because I don't, um, I don't believe that that can really affect me. If, right. Unless I have a belief that it can. Right. And I agree about that. So I, I don't believe it can affect me. I know my body has a really good, um, like disposal system or capacity to deal with toxins and get them out really quickly. I know my body has that. Um, it didn't used to have it, but now it does. Um, but I would say the best way to be able to do that stuff, like I, I don't watch the news, but I will read a headline here or there, or I'll check out something. And the reason I knew about that was because somebody that's also in alignment sent me that. And part of the reason I have this show called Stories We Love, which is where I interview people, there are people working on this stuff. And they're brilliant. So I think things are always going to, it's going to work out. But also, like I've, like I said, I, you know, if you really want to have the ability to be immune to the circumstances of life, to be immune to criticism, to be immune to the ups and downs of what happens in the world. To, and by immune, I mean, able to be completely in a state of love and joy and freedom shining like the sun. Get, clearing away the uh, subconscious blocks, that to me is the the most efficacious path. The other path to me, like Bruce Lipton, I don't know if this is accurate, but he said it's according to science, but still, I don't know. He said that we are in our conscious mind 5% of the time. That means 95%, if he's accurate, of the time we're unconscious, our subconscious is running the show. So when you're driving, often, you know, you're singing to the song or whatever you're doing, dancing in the car. That's what I do. Um, <laughs> when you're driving, your subconscious is driving and you're, if you're thinking about something, your subconscious is taking over. So if you get your subconscious, so it's in alignment with your spirit, where it's in alignment with what you want, then your subconscious is driving the car in the same direction that you want to go when you're reading a headline you don't want to read or or you don't want to think about too much. So, but here's the thing that's also cool. Part of the reason I did stories we love is because there's all these issues, you know, and I care a lot about the environment. Environment. I care a tremendous amount about children. Yes. And, and, and you love science. I mean, and I like science. yes. So like I interviewed a guy who is recreating the kelp because California has lost 94% of its kelp. And so he's recreating kelp right now in Mexico. But then because of all these, you know, I know a lot of cool people. I'm I'm doing all this inner work. Uh, I shouldn't say inner, but this interesting work, connecting people up with the people that can make things happen, where the bureaucracy can get ameliorated, where people can do the good stuff that they want to do. So I'm working in that capacity. Um, I'm a, a really good connector. I like connecting people with people who can benefit them. So I'm doing that. So all this stuff to me, I kind of like knowing what's going on because then I can connect people with the people that are helping with it. You know, like if this girl's making these filters and, you know, people are talking about this, well, maybe they want to connect up and we can use the filters and put it as a something over the ground even you know, on a farm so that the forever chemicals are, don't go into the earth or however, you know, there's got to be ways to do it. I don't know yet, but, you know, I love the science of what can we discover? How can we mimic the way nature does it? Because nature has an incredible brilliance that is so, and then when you look at something like a tree, there are trees in my neighborhood where people have chopped the tree off and what's happening? Trees are growing out of the tree. It's just another, it just doesn't stop. Nature is so brilliant and it's such a beautiful example of, mm -hmm. of resilience, of perseverance, of capacity, of innovation, of diversity, of geniusness. It's so vast and beauty and abundance. I mean, it's just incredible what nature exemplifies and how nature teaches. Yes. Yes. And see, and I think it just goes to show. So it's like, you can see, you can tell how passionate you are about the subject. So again, it's like, if it feels good, if this, like thinking about these subjects feel so good to you, it's so obvious. 
And, and that's really the, the thing, like the law of attraction. Does, how does this feel? How does this feel? Does this feel good? Does this subject matter feel good? If not, you know, then go put your attention on something else that feels good because that's about your alignment. Yeah. And for me, one of the things that I've found is how to get my subconscious to love everything. So my subconscious can love the forever chemicals. I can love the forever chemicals. So it doesn't matter. Like, that's why it doesn't bother me. I can still look at it I can, and then I can create something phenomenal from it. Does that make sense? Okay, so, yeah. So I can relate to that in like, say, like politics. Like I could, I used to judge and say oh that's that's person is bad or that person has bad opinions or bad ideas and now i was in a restaurant in new york recently and i was you know like they were, i was sitting next to that one of those people and they're right there and i'm like that it's just a human being it's another yeah. spirit we are all one like and here i am and i just said you know i can maybe not agree with their ideas but i can still like i it doesn't trigger me anymore when i see when i hear yeah so so it's like sort of the same thing like with with science or with any of those things chemicals or anything i i, I kind of want to stay away from that but like different subjects it's just finding finding your alignment that's the main thing if you've been thinking about coaching with me and how it could help you transform your relationship with your body and food, and yes, even release pounds, or if you'd like help with anxiety, depression, self-confidence, money, or health, I'd love to work with you. Our focus in your session is always to help you feel better emotionally and float up the emotional scale. You will find that as I calibrate you to feeling better and as you practice alignment during the week, you might be guided to a certain food plan or a certain physical activity and it will feel different than all those other times because it will be from a place of inspiration, not from a place of desperation where you are constantly trying to force change. In other words, imagine being inspired to do things you've been wanting to do for years without much efforting at all, without a big struggle. This is the way the law of attraction works. I know, like me, you were probably taught that things need to be difficult in order to make progress in any area of your life, but that simply is not true. There is an easier way, and I want to share this process with you. If this resonates with you, go to deliciousalignment.com slash coaching to find out more or to book your coaching sessions with me. I can't wait to meet you. So I do want to ask you, I did read something here that I just absolutely love. And because I have a mantra that I always say, and you had a different take on it. And it's everything is always working out for me, right? And you said, I'm quoting you now that now that feels like a low vibration for me, that quote that that mantra, everything is always working out for me. And I feel lifted up and lightened up by the thought I am I am receiving everything I want in every moment. Yeah, and that was four years ago when I wrote that book. So yeah. it just keeps evolving and getting better and better. So yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, I mean, that that quote, there's nothing wrong with that quote. And it was helpful, the, the first one about everything's working out for me. That's a great, that's great. And that's really helpful where somebody's at. And then as you keep growing, things that were in alignment for me even yesterday aren't always in alignment for me today because I keep growing. So things that I thought were like, I'm trying to think of other things like, um, oh, there's just so many ways I'm trying, like, for example, um, you know, people are really sweet, right? Now it's like, it's evolved to like, people are amazing. People are incredible. People are so loving and so kind. And it's just, it just keeps expanding. So yeah, they're still sweet and so much more keeps coming. So, uh, so it's, it's an evolution, you know, so things you'll watch, you'll watch there. I, I have, um, you know, like, uh, things I've written out about what I want and I read it now and I'm like, oh, I got to rewrite this. It's I'm so low on there. I got to go up, you know? And so, I keep evolving in that sense and finding that's why you keep growing. There's never a place 
where you're not going to keep growing. And that's one of the things that I really love. Yeah. Yeah. It just really, you know, resonated with me because I was like, oh yeah. Oh yeah. I think I'm there. I think I'm, I'm like evolving. Like I, I'm going to start saying that I am receiving everything I want in every moment. And I still, I still like my mantra. Everything is always working out for me. Like you said, but the, you know, I, I like this. I feel the, I feel the pull. I feel the, you know, the growth, the evolution to that. And um, I just had a couple other things because just really a wonderful book. And, and uh, I just noticed like the, the definition of the word chronic, because I, I, have known about your book for a while and just like thought it was so interesting how you put those two words together, chronic pleasure. And I actually looked up the definition of chronic and it is, um, you know, cause I always thought it was something more like negative happening over time. Uh, but it's, it's one of the definitions is it's simply that something that's continuing a long time or recurring frequently. So who doesn't more want more of that, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I got to say, because I like um, etymology where words come from. And the yeah. word chronos is time. So it's not even, it's like we've just co-opted the word in our culture to talk about chronic fatigue, chronic pain, mm -hmm. whatever, those kind of things. And that's why I wrote it because I was so diagnosed with all these chronics that when I, when I shifted and people would say, you know, how come? Because like I had a boo-boo on my hand. I had accidentally severed three tendons on the back of my hand. I was in hand therapy. I had surgery. And while I'm in hand therapy, people are like, you know, the guy's massaging me and everything. Like, Don't you have any pain? I was like, no. And they say, how come? I'm in chronic pleasure, you know? And so <laughs> I just, you know, it was just a way to make a joke, but also understanding the etymology of the word chronos literally just means time. Okay. So you're saying that and, and I did read this in the book, but you're saying that you should have had pain. I mean, in the doctor's eyes and you had no pain, you severed three tendons and you had zero pain because you were already on this path of chronic pleasure that you didn't even feel that. Yeah. I mean, I was going to go bike riding that day. It only, the only reason I didn't, I had blood gushing out and I was trying to find a band aid. My neighbor came over and I said, do you have a butterfly bed? And he goes, you got to go to the hospital. I go, why? He goes, you're going to need stitches. I go, no, I'm not. And he goes, you're going to need stitches and you better go to the hospital. Or I'm going to take you right now. I was like, fine, I'll go to the hospital. It's called my friend to say, I'm not going to go bike riding. At least, you know, I'll call later. But I, I was at the, I was in the waiting room for hours. So didn't, didn't go bike riding. But um, yeah, I didn't know it was even hurt. And then when he did the surgery, I didn't need, you know, I did local because he is going in and you know, doing stuff, but I did, but so that was, so I did use local, but he said, you know, you could use anesthesia and I was like, nah, just local. It's fine. And then they said, do you want things? And I said, no. And they said, just get 10 in case, 10 pills um, in case. And I said, okay. And I tried one half of a pill and I was like, this is stupid. I don't feel it. I don't need it. Like, mm -hmm. I was like, just like, cause they said to try it. And I was like, oh. like, but it didn't, it didn't do anything. And I think, you know, our brain chemistry can change so much that like my brain used to be in chronic pain all the time, my body, my brain, everything, chronic pain. And now it's so immune, you know, like I, I've had it where <laughs> I was with a girlfriend and we were laughing and we walked into a restaurant I'd gone to a bunch of times and they moved a bench. So the bench was between where you walk in and where the restroom was. It was like a bench where you wait mm -hmm. and you're supposed to walk around and then go, but they had changed it. And I was talking to her and I assumed it was going to be, you know, an open pathway. So I'm looking at her and I hit the bench. There was nobody on it. Thank God I would have been in their lap, but I hit the bench. I would have seen them though, probably if they were there, I hit the bench and I fell down, you know, hit my knee against the bench, hit my head against the cement floor. Um, and I got up and I was cracking up and she goes, are you all right? I was like, oh my God, I don't even feel it. And I had a lump on my leg where it hit and a lump on my head, uh, you know, for a couple of days, but it, it was, it, it was a big lump. It was like, you know, like mm -hmm. a big lump, like a, a good half inch and it, it didn't hurt at all. We were just it's laughing. Awful. Okay. So I'm trying to wrap my mind around that. So why, why is that Karen? Why, why are you not feeling pain? Explain that to us. 
I will explain it because I learned about it by a doctor who doesn't believe it, even though he teaches it. So there are what in, what are called in our brains hedonistic hotspots. They are points in our brain that are focused upon pleasure. I had unknowingly created and grown. So anything in your brain can grow or, or decrease depending on how you focus on it, right? So as I was getting more and more aligned, as I was clearing away the subconscious, as I was programming my subconscious with more and more pleasure, the hedon hedonistic hot spots grew and grew and grew. What most people do is they grow their pain spot so much that it takes over their pleasure spots. I just happened to accidentally do it the other way. And then I read about it in this book that this doctor had written about. And I thought, oh, that's so interesting. And now it made sense. So my hedonistic hotspots, I think my whole brain and my whole body have turned into hedonistic hotspots, <laughs> meaning they're so devoted to pleasure. I want to know. It was like, okay, I'll have what she's having. <laughs> okay, we all want to know how to grow our hedonist hedonistic hotspots in our brain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's and it, they're not just in your brain. They're in your body. They're mm -hmm. in your spine. They're in your sacrum. They're in your sex organs. They're in your belly. They're in your heart. They're in your arms are in your hands or in your feet they're in your legs it's like everywhere that doctor didn't talk about that that's just what i feel is that we have these we have the capacity for pleasure in every single part of our body and i just happen to be a person who wanted to explore that i've been a, <laughs> i've been a sexuous person all my life and so when i started to think about this i thought why are they just regulated to the brain that doesn't make sense it has to be everywhere and in fact we have a brain in our heart a brain in our gut if I understood the French book I'm listening to, which is a science French book about the different brains of the body. I know um, what you're going to say. I feel like. <laughs> we, all, we also have a brain in our um, fascia and in our skin. And I believe for sure we have a brain in our sex organs. Um, and so I, as I've been exploring those things and this, the body is a reflection of the subconscious mind. So as I kept shifting the subconscious programming that I had, and I kept releasing the traumas and, and releasing the old programming, my my brain na just naturally, my subconscious naturally became more pleasure filled because I because when I released it, I automatically added in what I wanted. So it was a release, a release and 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 then a insertion of what I wanted. And so I've just. I've, I've just found it, and this is what I teach my clients, like how to find that pleasure. It's kind of a longer process than we'd have in this thing, but, but there are different things you can do to start, but how to find that pleasure in every particle of your body, in every particle of your life. And then what happens, and even the doctor who talked about the hedonistic hotspots, he and both of their two doctors, they're brilliant, but I went to a seminar of theirs, like an online thing, and they said, you know, it's not possible to get rid of pain. And I thought, hmm, that's not right. That's not right. They're, they're speaking from an old model. Mm -hmm. Speaking from a model that's limited. They're not understanding that, they're, that you can clear pain. I mean, there is a thing, you know, like I go, oh, I've hit, I've hit the, the coffee table. I'm going to move to the left. Or, you know, that I, you know, I'm aware that I've hit something. But it, it, like if you stub your toe, like it doesn't hurt you. It would hurt for like maybe or a quarter of a second to where I know, oh, do something, you know, move away from the feet, whatever it is. But not but like it would have before. Like, oh my God, I stubbed my toe. No, 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 that's gone. I know that's it's gone. crazy, right? Because I used to, it is. Hurt, right? But it doesn't hurt. It, it hurts enough to like where I go, just like if somebody, if somebody, um, you know, is you're on a bus, and somebody's too close or a, or a subway and somebody's too close and you think, oh, I'm just going to step over to the side. It's like that. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not, and I'm not trying to not feel it. Yeah. It, but it doesn't, I think I'm so saturated in pleasure that. Yeah, it's really it, fascinating. So like there is a, there's a way to do that in your, you know, so the synopsis in the brain, the whatever, the hot points, the hedonistic hot points. Hedonistic, are, hot, hedonistic hot spots. And hot I've had two, two um, EEGs on my brain, electroencephalograms, which means that they put a cap on your head and they put all these electrodes and they test how your brain is working. Mm -hmm. The first time I did it, the guy said, you have a brain like a cap. And I said, what does that mean? He goes, you're completely relaxed. 
and you're completely ready and alert. Like a cat, C A T. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. And then he said, because I was then using my brain to play a, a car game where you race the car. And I, you know, I'm not moving, I'm just using my brain. And he said, I've never seen anybody who learns as fast as you do. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, it's not the kind of learning of, you know, intellectual learning. This is your brain figures things out faster than anybody I've ever seen. And that's not how it used to be. I mean, I, I used to have struggles to think straight. And then two years later, I did it again. And he said, this is incredible. I go, what? And he goes, you've increased by 20 to 30 points in attention, focus, memory, processing speed, and IQ. And I said, oh, that's cool. And, and he was like trying to figure it out. But to me, it made sense. I keep growing and my brain keeps feeling better. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So what would you say to someone who is experiencing physical pain? uh long-term you know problem sciatica i don't know any kind of yeah. pain that maybe they've had chronic pain that they've had for a while yeah first of all you're not wrong it's okay that you feel it it's normal you know that's normal um you know we've been trained to feel pain like that and it's not your fault and I would also say there are things you can do. Uh, my book that I, you mentioned, The Chronic Pleasure Book, I've written three books, but this book especially, um, it's endorsed by Deepak Chopra and Bruce Lipton on the back. It's endorsed it's by, yes, yeah, so say that again, I'm sorry. Endorsed by Deepak Chopra, which, um, and then did Bruce Lipton write the? Bruce Lipton also endorsed it. Gay Hendricks endorsed it. Yeah. And, and other people. Um, yeah. but, so that book, Chronic Pleasure, um, use the law of attraction to transform fatigue and pain into vibrant energy. That has a lot of practices in it. So you could literally get that and I'll tell you how to get the, that at the end of the podcast. But um, something you can do, you want to look, let, let's say you're in bed and you can't do anything, right? You're just stuck in bed and you have so much pain that everything hurts. You could literally just focus on something that you like that's simple. It doesn't have to be anything that's real in your life. Like, for example, one of the things I focused on when I first started doing this where I couldn't really function, I couldn't really do much. And I started to think, what, what could I appreciate? And I thought, well, I do love trees. But then I got obsessed with trees. <laughs> I've actually always been obsessed with trees. So then I started thinking about, you know, trees are brilliant. You can cut off part of the tree and it's still gonna keep growing in other parts. You can grow the, like where I live, there's hills, very steep hills. Trees come out like this and then they go up. You know, the tree can come out totally crooked and then still go straight. Yes. Yeah. Trees, trees communicate with each other through a mycelium connection so that they have they have their roots and then there's mushrooms underneath. Mm. The, the yeah, trees. I saw the documentary <laughs> on Netflix. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Like the mushrooms in the trees are communicating with each other. What documentary did you see? Because I don't think I've seen it's it. Some, something fungi. Fantastic. Oh, oh, fantastic fungi. I did see that one. Yeah. But this is something that I've seen also in other things because it's a, um, yeah. And then there's a tree that's as big as a football field in India, a banyan tree. And then there's trees, you know, they provide us oxygen. They take in the carbon I dioxide. Love trees. I love trees as well. Pain right. Yes. Is that something somebody could literally, even if you can't physically write, you could just close your eyes and think of something. And you don't just think, I like trees. You just think, what is it I like about them? Oh, I like that they have this neuronal connection, this internet between the, chi the chi trees. Trees, if you have a, a forest of trees or a jungle of trees and a certain kind of moth that infects trees gets access to one tree, within five minutes, 10 miles away, they're gonna be making antibodies. There's a connection. Wow, yeah. And so you go, you go, wow, you know, there's an intelligence. There's an ability, a resilience. Mm -hmm. You know, they can grow even when they top down. So you start to look at the little things that, of something you like. It could be something like, you know, bubble hockey. You like playing bubble hockey and it's like really fun and it's, it's kind of easy. And you could just think about what you love about bubble hockey, right? <laughs> Which is that thing with the, with the. Okay, okay, on the table. So you're saying like focus on something you appreciate? Yeah, and little things. It doesn't have to be something in your life. It could be, you know, like I like watching basketball, not all the time, but every once in a while. 
especially the highlights. I like the, I, I actually like just watching the highlights really, but it's so fascinating. You know, they look like they're intuitive. They look like they know who's behind them at the, in the moment they can make, they're so assured. They can make a, a three pointer with effortless ease. They're so cool. They know exactly how to do things. They're like, it's just like this incredible dance. They're like the birds that know which way to go. There's so much brilliance in how they communicate, even just with eye contact or with just a movement, they can communicate with their teammates in a way that the other people can't see like there's so much brilliance everywhere that you look that if you find it in something that you like something that's specific to you and you just focus on that it's going to be good another thing you can do is doing breathing that goes deep mm -hmm. i lie in bed i love this it feels so good i imagine that i'm breathing into my sacrum the sacrum is the big big bone right above your tailbone and right below your spine. The sacrum, it's kind of shaped like a, almost like a, a large triangle. Mm -hmm. that, that sacrum, I believe it's meant to be pumped with every breath. That's mm -hmm. something I've just discovered. And when it does, it starts to pump. This is my theory. I might not be right. Somebody has to do the research. I haven't done the research except on me and my clients. But I think that when you're breathing and you're imagining that your breath is moving your sacrum it's not going to move that much but it's that's just the visual so you have it which is like it's moving maybe a quarter of an inch when you breathe but it's going to pump your cerebral spinal fluid up which then washes through your brain and causes your brain to have more nourishment and causes your spine to have more nourishment and so that deep breathing the other thing about breathing if you breathe into your belly and your diaphragm goes down then your diaphragm is massaging all your digestive organs, including your kidneys. Your digestive organs are being pushed down by your diaphragm. So they're massaging your sex organs. So you could literally just be breathing and get an internal massage or get your cerebral spinal fluid going up your brain. They're two different types of massages, but one is breathing down into your belly and one is breathing into your sacrum. And, um, you know, both of those feel really good to do. So, so you're saying that that someone who's having a pain issue for a while and is, hasn't found something to help it, that mo those might be some things that they could do that could help? Yeah, those could help on the, uh, for sure, if you were able to focus on it for, you know, longer and longer each day, something like that. Like I, when I write my books, for example, or when I'm not talking, a little harder when you're talking, but when I'm writing, oh, butterfly that hit the window. And really, <laughs> when I'm um, when I'm talking, it's not as I don't do it as much. Boy, that butterfly is like wanting to come in the house. Um, the the ability to breathe. If I'm if I'm typing a book because you know I write the books, I'm kind of dictating the. I mean, the, I'm hearing a dictation and I'm just channeling basically. <laughs> But as I'm writing, I'm breathing. And so I'm almost at the point of like sexual ecstasy of the breath, just the breath. I have good posture when I write, you know, and I'm just breathing and it just feels so delicious uh, that, you know, it just translates into the words as well. And also my heart is full of love. There's another thing that people can do that um, I find really simple is, um, you know, drink more water. <laughs> yeah. A lot of times when people have back aches, when they have poor digestion, when they have a headache, when they have a migraine, it's often because of dehydration. So that's something simple. But the best thing I think for removing pain, the best thing I think is clearing away the subconscious blocks. Because mm -hmm. when you clear those, those are usually the, the areas why we have the pain, why we have some disease. It, yeah. doesn't, it doesn't mean... That's the only reason you could also have pain for, you know, for other reasons, but when the blocks are cleared, pain, you, you'll have a significant decrease in the pain. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, um, the technique, the Mallison method that I use, we're doing, we're feeling the emotion, the negative emotion, which is interesting because for so long, I was just like pivoting. I'm not going to feel this negative emotion. And now it's like, we're actually 
feeling it and, vi and moving up the emotional scale and calibrating that emotion. So it sounds like kind of, uh, you know, I'm not, I haven't had a session with you. So maybe, you know, maybe that's something I'll do and just see what that's like. And it's uh, just so, I just see miracles all the time with people's health, just improvements as you're helping. And I'm sure you do as well. I know you do. I hear the stories. I read the stories, people that are just getting amazing results with you. And I, I want to say there's something in here uh, you talk about in your book, um, changing cultural hypnotic suggestions. And then you have one about aging, releasing the cultural hypnosis of aging. Can you talk a little bit about that? That's really yeah, yeah, we're programmed. <laughs> Oh, when you get a certain age, you're gonna have this experience. Oh, as you get older, these things diminish in your body. Oh, as you get older, these things grow, get more. Oh, um, when you when you get to a certain age, you know you're gonna have less energy. You're gonna have all this. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, but yes, it is not true. And when you start to recognize what are those programmings, and then you start to undo them and and put in what you want, it's so fun. I mean, my my doctor says I have the physiology of a 17 year old. I'm mm -hmm. juicier as a woman. I'm juicier now than I ever have been, even as a teenager. I'm like, and I don't do any bio, I don't do any drugs or anything, no hormones, nothing. Um, but yeah, and it's just, it's amazing what can happen. My eyesight has improved. My hair has gotten thicker. My nails have gotten stronger. My bones have gotten stronger. I mean, everything can improve. Mm -hmm. So so that whole there's a whole slew of stuff that almost the doctor will tell you oh when you get older this is going to diminish when you get older you're going to have these problems when you get older your genes aren't going to replicate accurately when you get older you're telling me to, i'm like bullshit excuse me so that's why, that's why you're calling it you have it many different chapters or practices in your book you've got another one all about these cultural hypnosis, like the cultural hip hypnosis of food. And, and we're, I can't believe it's almost, you know, an hour already we're talking. So, um, but I just want to let everyone know that Karen in this book, she's got releasing cultural hypnosis of food, releasing negative emotions that cause allergies, releasing cultural hypnosis of astrology, because that could, you know, there's a culture where, oh, this is going to happen. And oh, it's, you know, Mercury's in retrograde. So it's like all, all of this is feeding into the programming that is creating fear or whatever yeah and right. the aging thing yeah i remember just oh yeah well when you you're gonna you know you're gonna slow down when you get you know older when you get this age or that age you're gonna slow down and yeah and you're just that's when you're gonna start look looking yeah when i turned 60 you know some, um, someone was telling me when i turned 60 yeah that's when my looks really you know you can't look younger anymore <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 that's not true yeah it's it's really interesting because we're programmed in so many ways yeah. and um and i think the thing about you know being able to honor your emotions is really good but then there's another layer to it for me anyway you know just because i did have a lot of trauma and um you know i had a lot of trauma and uh so I had to find ways to heal the trauma. So for example, like the narcolepsy I had, the way it healed is, I didn't remember this, but when I was like three or four, my whole neighborhood was driving, um, not driving, but bike riding on the sidewalk around the block. But they were older, most of them, so they had bikes. I had a big wheel. I'm trying to keep up, you know, I'm the little one. So I'm trying to keep up. And, um, you know, when the root of the tree goes and makes the sidewalk buckle mm -hmm. up, mm -hmm. So when in that when I saw that big hill, it was huge at the time. <laughs> you know, oh, it's real big, and I got scared. Mm -hmm. And then when I hit the lip of the second piece of uh, sidewalk. My I lost control of my big wheel, and I went headfirst into a sycamore tree. And I didn't know what had happened consciously. Nobody told me. I had I know I I know I had a concussion. That's the only thing they said. So I had a concussion from around four in that afternoon till about noon the next day, so twenty hours, mm -hmm. and um and I was out. And one day, as I was doing some deep work with myself, I remembered my Dr. Bouch, who was my, my childhood physician, he came to my house that night and my mom and dad and him were talking and I was on the couch and I could see myself floating above my little body that was just on the couch. Hmm. And I was, I was completely unconscious. 
And um, he said to my parents, you have to wake her up every hour or she could die. Mm. My little brain heard that and decided I better wake up every hour or I could die. What is narcolepsy? You wake up a lot during the night and you never get a full sleep. That's why you're tired all day. So I, I realized that. And then I shifted that whole belief system and I shifted it, that whole, that whole belief system. And then that night I started sleeping deeper last night. Like I can sleep nine hours or eight hours or nine hours, you know, sometimes all in a row. Sometimes I get up to go use the restroom, but -hmm. like I am sleeping like unbelievable compared to ever in my life. Yeah. I think since that time, because that little part of me believed I better wake up. And once I was able to shift that whole subconscious belief system, it, I just, and I did it all that morning. It literally shifted yeah. my sleep. So it's often that, and I've done that like with, you know, sometimes like I had an emotional conflation, I call it a conflation between ice cream and love, right? <laughs> ice cream oh, and- yeah recognize that <laughs> i think i got well, that inflation <laughs> yeah most people a lot of people have it with something doesn't have to be ice cream but something they have it with right it could be um tortilla chips whatever but so i had this conflation meaning i had linked love celebration soothing with ice cream yes and so when i saw it it opened up and i was able to shift it and it's like those two pieces became their own separate thing and so then I could have the love. And if I wanted, I could have the ice cream. I don't want it anymore because now I have the love on a consistent basis mm-hmm. and, and the celebration and all of that stuff. So I didn't need the, the thing that was masquerading or that was connected to the love to get me to the love. I could just get to the love and it shifted it, but I had to undo some of the subconscious programming. Because, you know, there was like decades of, you know, uh, Sunday night, hot fudge Sunday. Oh, Tuesday night. Let's ride to the, get the ice cream on yeah, our bike. I mean, I, I think it's the same thing with me. I mean, you know, my mother, um, she wasn't very affectionate or anything like physically, but she, she loved to go out and go shopping and buy me things. And then we go, you know, have a hot fudge Sunday. I mean, that was like, yeah. So I couldn't play. bonding time. So- so now you've got your Sunday with bonding, with yes. time, with quality time, yeah. with, with someone that you care about. And, you, and it's a way for you to see that you're valued, that you're important. Yeah. Right. So it's a special, you know, it's a special thing, but when you can unlock it and you see, oh, there's this one thing and then there's this other thing and they don't have to be connected. It's beautiful when you see that, like when I see that with people and, you know, from working with them and they, yeah, they're, they're distinct making that distinct just you know the distinction and then and and a lot of people they're not they actually turn the other way and they're they like rebel against food or i don't they don't know how to even enjoy food anymore either yeah you can't do that it all gets all kind of um so so just to heal that relationship with food it's just like i i love when that light bulb goes off and people can just like okay i this is ice cream and this is love and you know and and they're and I, lo- I can also love the ice cream but it's not but i can also have, feel love in my you know my body and in my emotion yeah. so uh please let us know how people can find you and what you want them to know. Um, I know you have a couple other books and your website and, and whatever it is that you'd like to have. Yeah, with my, really, if they really want to connect with you. Yeah, I'll share really quickly. I have this book called Effortless Enchantment. That's a memoir because I'm an actor and I've done over a thousand hours of TV and film and I've had an exciting life. And then I have this other book, Chronic Pleasure in Relationships, Inspire the Best in Men. It's written for women, but men like it as well. So first of all, you can get all my books for free at Chronic pleasure book, singular book, but you'll still get all the books there, chronicpleasurebook.com. And if you go to that website, you're going to get an email and that email can contact me as well. Um, but you'll get, and you'll get the books, you can download them for free. So that's one place. I also have, um, two podcasts. One is called chronic pleasure podcast. And one is called stories. We love stories. We love. I interview people who are doing good in the world. And so you can watch both of those on YouTube or go to iTunes, Spotify, um, audio, um, audible, 
a striker, whatever, all of them you can go. Um, so I'm doing that and you can just watch those there and that's free. And then um, my my name is Karen Laurie, L-O-R-R-E. And I'm on Facebook. If you send a friend request, but you don't make a message, I probably won't see it. I'm getting hundreds of friend requests every day. So what I'd love is if you send me a message, I might go into my spam, so I might not see it right away, but I check my spam. And um, if you send me a message through then, and, and you can also send a friend request, but at least if you send the message, I'll actually see the friend request. Um, uh, a private message on Facebook. Yeah, a message on okay, okay. That private message. And then I have a website called Chronic Pleasure Coaching, but I'm giving you too many things. So the th one thing to remember, the one thing to remember is chronicpleasurebook.com. And then from that, everything else, you'll have access to it. Yeah, well, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for, that's a wonderful gift. You get all the books, three books. This is, wow, incredible. Yeah. incredible. I, yeah. I downloaded, uh, I have two of them just highly recommend them. I loved it. Like I said, it just like elevated my vibration, just reading it. It's like, this is just like one giant big rampage. I just love it. So mm. thank you're you. so sweet. Thank you so much. Amanda. Yes. So, so beautiful and so fun and you're radiant. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, again, we want to say, go get those books from Karen and check her out. She's awesome. She has had and is continuing to have an amazing life. So just really all good stuff. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Karen Laurie. You can connect with Karen at her website, KarenLaurieCoaching.com. That's Laurie with two R's. Find all the links mentioned in this podcast at DeliciousAlignment.com slash podcast. Also, I want to let you know that I've got wonderful guests lined up for you in the coming months with people who have used the law of attraction to learn how to love their bodies and their food, as well as attract more health and happiness into their lives. Do you know someone who could benefit from the delicious alignment message? If so, help me spread the word by sharing this podcast with your friends. Thanks again for listening. I love hearing how this podcast show is making a difference in your life. Till next time.